In the legislature in, in Oklahoma, I think uh, what I would do ahead of time, I'm part of the Impact Network, which is a conference of churches advocacy group. And we have formulated principles on five different issues and presented them to the legislature. I would probably proceed that way and say as part of this uh, <clears throat> interdenominational Christian group. This is what we have uh, formulated biblically and theologically about criminal justice. Now, I, I know there are limitations on, on church and state, but the rule of law can be influenced from many sources. And I know many of you here are people of faith. I'm going to ask you to consider that as we talk about what is right from the point of view of justice. Again, I can't promise lower crime rates, but I don't think we're achieving that because of what we're doing now. I think we can talk about much greater victim satisfaction than we have now, and that probably should be important to you. They're voters and constituents. Uh, we can talk about some human values that have always characterized the people of this state. I think people here believe that it's important to fess up when you've done something wrong and, and try to fix something uh, when, when you've done it wrong. And these, these are our values, and the current system really doesn't have a place for them. My involvement in restorative justice is, to me, an expression of Christian ministry. And the ministry that I do can so easily get diffused, uh, uh, lose its concentration because of a temptation to become a social service agency. And likewise, in advocacy, it's easy to lose the character, the biblical theological character of this. So I, I try to, to work very hard to be aware of those boundaries in both the direct ministry and in the ministries of advocacy. So as not to appear to just belong in some political camp of one kind or another. I'm thinking it was Mark Umbright that I heard say one time, I really appreciated this, he said, the problem with restorative justice is it has no political constituency. Liberals don't like it because it's high on offender accountability and victim involvement. Conservatives don't like it because it's low on punishment and has a disdain for prisons. And I really, really thought he had a good description. I guess I still subscribe to the early Howard Zayer, the, the paradigm shift of the two lenses learning to see the world differently through the lens of restoration as opposed to the lens of, of retribution. And, and I've heard Howard say that in a punitive system, basically these restorative expressions, probably better called restorative processes when there's no paradigm shift. And that the paradigm shift language would, would still apply to restorative justice. The question that has intrigued me for a long time in, in teaching my, my law course is, is I look at the works of Michel Foucault, which I take fairly much uncritically, that indeed we have, we've reached a time where uh, we define a deviant and a norm through a lot of surveillance and study, and we try to individualize things, but basically we proceed by the application of coercive power, believing we can transform a deviant into a norm that has a lot to do with how we do criminal justice. And briefly looking at, at, at the history of corrections, that uh, the Walnut Street Jail thought the environment was the problem, the Auburn model thought a uh, lack of discipline and laziness uh, was, was a problem, needed hard work and discipline, the reformatory model needed education and training, and the medical model that crimes is sickness, and finally hit up against nothing works because Nothing had satisfactorily worked up to that point, although now we're in the evidence-based practices and that might be another discussion. But what I realized as a law professor was what, that all of those ideas were appropriate. The people I work with on the ground environment is part of the problem. A lack of discipline and, and, and an aversion to hard work is often part of the problem. A lack of education and training is part of the problem. And behavior that represents a sickness is part of the problem. None of those were bad ideas. But what they all had in common was the application of coercive power to transform a deviant into a norm. And then I mean, aha, restorative justice is the solution, except uh, I cannot imagine a scenario under which there is no coercive power presence. 
the question I explored in the paper is at what level does the, the infusion of coercive power so corrupt a process that it cannot be called restorative justice anymore? But is there a place that we can call it restorative justice, understanding that a certain level of coercion is going to exist? And, and I started the project because I wanted to, with no certain answer in mind as to what the conclusion was going to be. I think that drug courts, Vermont reparative boards, mental health courts probably can be done in a way with the right spirit that I would call them restorative justice. But when the prosecutor insists on having a formal case filed to do that, in my judgment, that begins to poison the well. If you can basically say, I've got a police report, it's going in the file. If you want to do drug court, that's an option for you. I, I, I can live with that as not having corrupt that pro corrupted that process. I think then when you look at the full range of restorative justice values, the participation, victim, offender, community, the, uh, the repairing of, of harms, the meeting of needs, be they offenders uh, or, or uh, uh, victims or the community itself, and, and the whole litany if you just sort of look at it and say, you know, what's the preponderance of evidence here? Again, as Professor McCord was talking about this morning, the victim satisfaction, the offender satisfaction, not just recidivism, but, but anything you can think of that, that involves restorative values and principles, if you can say, yeah, by the preponderance of the evidence, this is more restorative than not. And reasonable minds may differ. One of the things that came up in, in the presentation I follow the Sullivan and Tiff's notion that, that justice ought to be needs-based. And offenders, as somebody that works with them, bring a lot of needs to the table. And many times uh, the criminal thinking, uh, as well as the drug alcohol treatment, are, are part of it. I believe that, that out of a victim-offender sort of conference or mediation, it's okay to have a term in there that there'll be a chemical dependency assessment or that the offender needs to go uh, through a cognitive therapy paradigm. My colleague and, and co-presenter took the other side of that. Said, that's too much coercion, that's too much interference, that's too much state involvement. That can't be restorative justice. So she and I, uh, reasonable minds differ as to that one.